What the Thunder Said, Tales from the Angels Share, Volume 2, by Morella Sands, read by Rhett McPherson. Chapter 1 I drank my tea and looked in on my pet hedgehog, Petunia. She was rather grumpily retiring for the night, night that is, for her, which was morning for me. The pink and gold dawn was flawed only by the yellow haze which sat heavily on the city of St. Louis and from which we were likely to see no relief in the near future. A high pressure system had parked itself over the area and we were in for a further week or two of high temperatures, high humidity, and no wind. Although I loved cloudless blue skies, the past month of unrelenting, record-breaking heat and lack of rain was becoming oppressive. Petunia yawned and retreated into her box. She was a fairly easy pet to deal with, especially since my live-in boyfriend Castro did the most for her. He also did almost all of the other chores around the apartment while I worked to support us, which I hadn't done for the past several days. Castro came into the kitchen, whistling some tune I knew I'd heard on the radio recently, but which I couldn't identify. He kissed me before grabbing his morning coffee. And how's my lovely lady this morning? You mean me or the hedgehog? He didn't bat an eye. The hedgehog, of course. I know how you are, edgy and perpetually pissed. I almost said something to that, but kept my mouth shut. No mean feat for me. Still, he wasn't wrong. I was perpetually pissed these days and terrified because I now knew that strange, even supernatural things were happening all around me and I wasn't going to have the option to tell them to leave me alone. That was a tough thing to live with. I hadn't figured out how yet. Castro looked at himself in the glass front of the microwave and ran a finger through his coffee-dark hair. It was just now long enough to touch the tops of his ears, which meant he was overdue at the salon. Not looking good, he said. I'll get it cut today before I head to the store. Can you think of anything else you want to put on the list? I wanted to shout at him that all I wanted was him and him to be safe. Four nights ago, I'd fought for his life with creatures of ungodly power and with help, I'd won. Fortunately for Castro, he didn't remember any of it. Unfortunately for me, that meant I couldn't talk to him about it or explain why I was suddenly so very clingy, even to the point of not going into work. I'd almost lost him. There was no reason another supernatural thing, I had no other word to use yet, couldn't come crashing into our lives today and threaten to kill him. What would I do then? How could I handle another attack on Castro? Instead of saying anything, I threw my arms around him and breathed deeply of his morning shampoo and aftershave scent. Lately, I had not been able to get enough of it, and I thought he was likely to lose patience for all this outward display of affection sooner or later. I know he was confused about this sudden desire of mine not to let him out of my sight, but I couldn't help it. I had come too close to watching him die. Hey, it's cool, he said. I'm just going to the store. I held back tears and looked into his dark brown eyes. I know, and I can't think of anything to add to the list. Movie marathon tonight, or will you be going into work? Marathon, I said, but something funny. Castro had a tendency to choose movies that bored me. Explosions, gunfights, not for me. And his second choice was horror, which normally I didn't mind, but which I had no appetite for now. Considering what I'd met in the underground tomb in Belfontaine Cemetery four nights ago, I wanted to forget all about ghosts, zombies, demons, and vampires. I had a sinking feeling my life was about to become full of them, or something even more primal, the things on which those legends had been based. I didn't need to watch movies about them, too. Castro bit his lip in what I considered his thoughtful face. We didn't have a ready stock of funny movies to watch. Neither did we agree very often on what constituted funny. But I think he realized that today was a good day to mollify me rather than to try to cajole me into watching whatever shoot 'em up blockbuster we'd missed at the theater and which had just hit Netflix or Redbox. So, do you want me to check the store for stuff in the $5 bin or what? I realized I had no idea what I wanted to watch other than I wanted to laugh. I shrugged. If you see something you think I'll like, fine, but otherwise we can check for something to stream online later. Okay. He looked unsure, but I knew he didn't want to antagonize me. You didn't do anything wrong, I said for the hundredth time in the past four days. I just have some things to work through. About my job, about my boss, about my life. I'm part of your life. The best part, I said, that's not what I have to think about. It's everything else. Okay, except Petunia. She's not going anywhere either. 
He looked as if he wanted to say something, but thought better of it. He gave me a brief hug and left, still bewildered. But what could I say? I didn't even know what was going on myself. I stared out the window at the small parking lot behind our building and watched his jeans and t-shirt clad figure emerge from the building and head to his ancient gray Civic. Castro got in the car, pulled out of the space, and headed out onto the street. I watched him until he turned the corner and his car disappeared behind the small Chinese restaurant on the corner. My heart thumped once, painfully, in my chest. I lost sight of the car. You're crazy, Terrell. He's fine. Let it go. But I still had a desire to run down the street and turn the corner just to see his car for a few seconds longer. I closed my eyes and leaned against the edge of the counter. I wasn't really crazy, was I? Just afraid of losing him. Afraid of what my boss had meant when he promised to tell me what was going on and give me a raise, don't forget that, he would give me information and a raise. In response, I hadn't been back to work. I just agonized stupidly over all the things I needed Castro for, all the things I couldn't bear to lose if he weren't in my life, if he died, if he were murdered by a monster. I took a deep breath. <sighs> four days, Terrell, it's been four days. Get off your ass and do something constructive. If I weren't careful, the very thing I feared would come to pass and it would be my fault. Castro would leave me because I would become too clingy, too afraid, too secretive, too something that he couldn't deal with or live with. I couldn't tell him about my dreams either and he knew I was having nightmares. For the past two nights I'd woken him up choking as if I were drowning. In my dreams I was trapped in a dark place and suffocating. I guess being in an underground crypt fighting for your partner's life will do that to you. I wasn't trapped anymore, but arguing with one subconscious is a losing proposition. I glanced around the apartment, wondering if there were anything I could do to push such thoughts aside and to make myself useful. Laundry was out, because Castro was very exacting about how it should be done and my efforts did not meet his standards. But I could pick up after myself. I put my breakfast dishes in the sink and looked under the sink for the dishwashing soap. I was pretty sure that was where we kept it, if we even had any. Castro often used the dishwasher, but I had no idea how to operate it. Dishes had to be hand-washed on my watch. Suddenly, I felt as if I were being watched. Slowly, I stood up straight, for a moment too freaked out to turn around. What if someone were there? What if it were either of the two men who tried to kill Castro and whose whereabouts were unknown? They might be here in my apartment, behind me. My stomach did a queasy roll and I clenched my fist to stop them from trembling. Slowly, I turned around. The only thing behind me was Petunia's cage, and behind that, the small front room of our apartment, complete with tattered couch and second or third or fourth hand furniture. The feeling didn't go away, though now it was less focused. Someone was around, they just weren't behind me. The roof. The thought popped into my head. It was forceful as if something wanted my attention and refused to be ignored. That something was on the roof. Consequently, the roof was the last place I wanted to be. I didn't even know how to get up there. I'd never tried. Why would I? People don't go to rooftops, at least not in any of the buildings I'd ever lived. But a second thought followed the first even more forcefully. Come up or I'm coming down. That did it. I couldn't bear the thought of something unholy and monstrous in my home. Whatever happened, I had to go to the roof. A sudden chill made me want to grab a jacket on this 90 plus degree day, but I didn't. The roof. I had no idea what awaited me up there. I only knew I had to go. I walked as slowly as possible. 